The Death and Life of a Aida Hernandez, A Border Story, Part 2, Chapter 2, read by Audiobooks. Two, English Without Barriers. A few weeks after arriving in Arizona, Ida confronted her mom. The family had gone from a comfortable two-story house in Mexico to a two-room adobe behind Kmart. In the house Saul rented for Luz and her children, a mattress on the floor functioned as communal bed and living room couch. When the children slept, Luz stayed awake brushing cockroaches off the baby's faces. Ida needed to understand the sudden change in her life. What are we doing here? She asked in the strongest voice she could summon. Since crossing the border, she felt older than her eight and a half years. Where is my dad and why is Saul acting like he's our dad? You have no idea what you're talking about, Luz said. Shut up, Ida, Jennifer added for good measure. Ida knew she had stumbled into the territory of a secret, but couldn't figure out how to stretch her small frame high enough to see the whole of it. Instead, she set herself to making her way in the United States. Five months after crossing the border, she entered a brand new school in her brand new country, determined to learn. Like other third grade girls at Sarah Marley Elementary during the 1996-1997 academic year, Ida dotted her eyes with bubbly hearts. She taped pictures of the Spice Girls and Missy Elliott on her binder, wore crop tops, and snapped hair scrunchies like a pro. What people noted most about Ida, though, was her smile. The word people used to describe her was resueña, sunny, although the English word sunny didn't do justice to the way that resueña beamed. Ida lit up a room, even when things were not going well for her, which they usually were not. Saul had moved the family to a new apartment, the second in a series of whiplash relocations that would define Ida's youth. The new place was an old row house in Central Douglas that would once have held smelter workers. The X-shaped former Phelps Dodge Hospital marked the end of her block. Saul, the man pretending to be Ida's dad, had a wife and kids in a nearby town. He moved Luz and her children from one apartment to another, like a stone he skipped over water, and disguised the expense by using each place as an office for the transportation company he owned. Saul tried to win Luz's children over at first, particularly the babies Jasmine and Emiliano, whom he showered with gifts. But deep down, he didn't have it in him. Unkindness fell from his mouth, heavy as a car hood with no stick to prop it up. Mira la negra fea, he let drop as he walked by Ida one day. She was writing something, a poem or song lyrics, her left-handed printing smeared on the page. You're so stupid, look at that handwriting. He grabbed the page from her and tore it up. Do it again and do it right. Saul tried to make up for insults with gifts, but got them all wrong. That spring, he brought over an almost new bicycle for Jasmine years before she could possibly ride one. He so clearly favored Emiliano and Jasmine, it ground into Ida, whose prized brakeless bike had stayed in Agua Prieta. Saul put Luz to work for his company. Off-duty drivers left their cars in front of the house. Luz and her daughters cleaned them out. Saul set up a radio in their cramped living room, and Luz ran dispatch. Sometimes he would yell at Ida to take over. I can't, she said one afternoon, shrinking away. Saul yelled at Luz to get out of her chair, hauling her up and pushing her out. Ida, get in this chair. Please, I can't. He yanked her arm and sat her down. Just say, cero uno a base. Zero one to base, come in. Ida, bouncing in the chair and on the verge of panic, couldn't get the words out. She was terrified of what would follow if she got it wrong. What is wrong with you? Ida could only make a shuddering hum. What? Louder, Saul said, shoving the microphone into her teeth. Cero uno a base. Ida tried, 
She tried to squeeze the words out. She tried with all her little girl might, but she couldn't. Fucking worthless, he growled and stormed off. Like this, the household settled into a manic rhythm. With six people in two or three rooms, they lived loud lives. At any given moment, someone had music turned up high. Babies, sibling spats, teenage angst, and television filled in around the music. Most nights, sleep was late and broken by interruption. Privacy was not a concept either understood until many years later. She forgot that the intensity of life could have a set point anywhere below maximum. When Saul stayed with his real family, six people crowded in a tiny apartment almost felt fun. Luz worked endless hours, desperate to keep Saul happy and a roof over her family's head. But at least she worked from home. Radio in one hand and babies in the other, she wrangled the family and, from time to time, cooked meals like the ones she prepared in Agua Prieta. Luz had set the family down hard in a new country, but they still had one another and a kind of manic joy. As soon as Luz received a call from Saul saying that he was on his way though, the atmosphere froze. Turn that music down, Luz would order, hanging up the phone. She and the girls would clean frantically. A single unwashed dish or patch of sand kicked in from the patio might cause Saud to explode. On days when she expected a visit from Saud, Luz scrubbed the floor obsessively with pine saw. For years, Ida cringed with the expectation of violence whenever she smelled floor polish. The house perfect, they would wait. Luz readjusted her hair and makeup. Ida made herself small, fearing what it might mean to be seen or heard by Saul. She never knew what would set him off. Whatever it was, her mother would suffer the most. Ida learned this lesson shortly after moving to Douglas. One night, a dull thud came from Luce's bedroom, waking the girls. They went to see what made the sound. Saul didn't even pause or look in their direction when Ida and her sisters opened their mom's door. With the craftsman's attention, he ragdolled Luce into the wall, hauled her back, and did it again. Their mother's body striking the wall was what had woken them. Shh, Luce managed to say, gesticulating at them to leave. For the rest of their lives, Ida and Jennifer would remember the animal instinct that followed. They flew at Saul, their fists bouncing uselessly off his broad back. They tried to pull him off. He flicked them away with one arm. Nothing they did made a difference. They yelled for him to stop, swearing and screaming for him to leave. They hoped that a neighbor would hear and help them, and the neighbors could hear everything that happened in that apartment complex. But no one came, and Saul didn't leave. Instead, he turned on the girls. They could see in his face that he intended to teach them a thing or two about not interrupting, but the lesson never came. Luce cracked across the room. In a concussive flash, they saw Luce shoot out of the background and flatten Saul, who was almost twice her weight. It was the first time Ida and her sisters had seen their mother being beaten, and the first time they saw her fighting back. But nothing surprised them as much as what happened next. As soon as Luce heard the front door slam and Saul's car start outside, she rounded on her daughters. Don't you ever do that again. Don't ever interfere. Just get away. Just go. Luce's rage scared them almost as much as Saul's savagery, but at some level they understood that it was her way of keeping them safe. From that point on, the girls learned to listen closely to the sounds of violence coming through the walls. They could distinguish between a backhand and a closed fist, the scrape of a body hitting a dresser, and the thud of a fall. When the noises reached a precise pitch, obvious only to a trained ear, the older sisters would grab the babies and run. They couldn't protect their mother, but they could protect one another. A small girl, jerked from one life to another in a single afternoon, could not see much beyond her own shock. 
but even Ida could feel the air of destitution emanating from her new home. From the start, she saw it exuding from Douglas's trailers and crumbling adobes, its wide, empty streets, and its countless stores in an indeterminate state of openness. The thrill of living in Los Unites mingled with sadness and loss. She knew nothing of the town's history, but she could almost feel her body absorbing the past. When Ida played tag with her sisters in a field outside the casita, she kicked up traces of that earlier era, dust heavy with arsenic, cadmium, and lead. The end of copper-based prosperity in Douglas had begun, as many great changes do, with an acute crisis. In 1980, the U.S. economy dipped into economic slowdown, the first leg of what would become a double-dip recession. Auto manufacturers purchased less copper for radiators, contractors bought less electrical wire, and telecom companies rolled out fewer telephone lines. In April 1982, PD suspended operations across the country to let demand catch up with supply. At first, the recession felt like others Douglas had weathered before. Residents knew the routine. Families would tighten their budgets. Store owners on G Avenue would struggle to stay open. Kids in college would worry about tuition payments and women would work harder. They would sell tamales door to door, take extra jobs cleaning executives' houses and earn grocery money mending clothes. During strikes, women banded together, organizing raffles and collecting donations for families in need. There was a fondness to the way people recalled previous strikes and recessions. They were interludes of solidarity filled with surprisingly happy memories. So residents rallied together and waited for the new crisis to pass and Douglas to return to normal. But years passed. The belts stayed tight and people worked harder still. Douglas residents began to understand that this time there would be no return to normal. The early 1980s crisis transformed not just Douglas, but the whole world economy. In the late 1970s, foreign and domestic pressures had fueled double-digit inflation in the United States. Taking over as chair of the Federal Reserve Board in 1979, Paul Volcker vowed to combat price increases by raising interest rates regardless of the danger. And the danger was clear. High interest rates would stabilize prices and please investors, but could also send the economy plunging into recession. Volcker forged ahead, and his decision signaled the rise of a new era of austerity and conservative economics, an era in which the interests of Wall Street would dominate those of Main Street. By 1981, Volcker's leadership pushed interest rates to 20%, stamping out inflation and sending the country into a brutal recession. As hard as it was for U.S. communities, <coughs> the policy shift rocked Latin America more. Through the 1970s, U.S. banks had fueled a bubble of frenzied lending to what was then called the Third World. These loans bolstered investor earnings and the dubious development schemes of authoritarian regimes. The debt had been manageable, though, as long as U.S. interest rates remained low. When Volcker sent rates skyward, the bubble popped. In the summer of 1982, Latin American governments, beginning with Mexico, threatened default, and the world economy teetered on the edge of collapse. U.S. commercial banks' exposure to Latin American debt was greater than their combined capitalization. Investment banks were even more heavily leveraged. Under pressure from Northern investors and international financial organizations, Latin American governments responded to the crisis by imposing extreme austerity and breakneck economic liberalization on their populations. These measures extracted money that countries could use to continue making debt payments, but also triggered a deep region-wide depression known as the Lost Decade. Latin America achieved fiscal solvency and helped U.S. investors earn windfall profits but at the cost of negative growth, unemployment, gutted social programs, and soaring poverty. Douglas felt the effects of the third world debt crisis more than many places in the United States, and not just because the crisis fueled increased migration from Mexico. For poor mineral producing nations such as Chile, 
Zambia, and Zaire, the debt crisis generated enormous pressure to extract and sell copper. Exporting as much copper as possible, as quickly as possible, made short-term sense, even if it caused world copper prices to plummet. For Chile, Zambia, Zaire, and their creditors, the only response to falling prices was to mine more. In the face of competition from low-cost third-world producers, PD might have diversified into sectors other than copper. It might have invested in technology to make its core business more efficient. The company took a different tack. Following a pattern that would feel all too familiar by the end of the Reagan years, it slashed wages and retreated from its commitments to workers. When PD workers struck to protest wage cuts in 1983, the company fired and replaced the striking workers. This action would change not just Douglas, but the entire country. President Reagan had shocked the nation just two years earlier when he fired and replaced striking air traffic controllers, but they had been public employees engaged in work essential to public safety. Until PD's action in 1983, there were no post-war precedents for a private company firing striking industrial workers on such a large scale. Thus, despite its small size and remote location, the town of Douglas lay at the center of pivotal events in the rise and decline of U.S. unions. On one end, the 1941 Phelps Dodge Rule heralded the ascendance of organized labor. It helped set the stage for rising prosperity and falling inequality that would define the post-war period. At the other end, PD's decision to fire striking workers in 1983 was the harbinger of a long assault on worker power. In the PD company towns of Morency and Clifton, Arizona, the firings sparked violent clashes between union workers, scabs, the National Guard, and police. In Douglas, long the spiritual heart of PD in the Southwest, 1983 was painful, but less violent. There, a wrenching feeling of betrayal was the dominant emotion. Union supporters shut down Park Avenue in New York. College students across the country rallied for copper workers, and Bruce Springsteen dedicated his song, My Hometown, to strikers during a concert at Arizona State University. None of it mattered to PD. For a company with an atavistic disdain for unions, the crisis of the 1980s was too good to waste. In previous decades, Workers and the company would have finally agreed on a contract. Both sides would have shaken off harsh words uttered in the heat of battle, and everyone would have returned to work. But this time, hundreds of unionized employees found themselves permanently replaced. PD's crew of short-term scabs had become the company's new permanent workforce, and they worked for well below the wage unionized employees had enjoyed. With the company's encouragement, the new employees voted to decertify PD's smelter union. By 1985, the U.S. economy had rebounded, and PD was again earning healthy profits, despite competition from abroad. Most fired workers were not rehired, though, and the company moved its executive offices out of Douglas. It was the kind of trauma, both economic and psychological, that few towns survive. Then it got worse. In the mid-1980s, environmental science had begun to identify the wide-ranging impacts of airborne industrial pollution. National debates centered on the problem of acid rain caused by sulfur dioxide emissions. And in this moment of heightened awareness, Douglas's smelter had just been declared the largest single manufacturing source of sulfur dioxide pollution in the country. Regulators and a burgeoning local environmental movement demanded that PD upgrade antiquated pollution controls in Douglas. Although the plant remained PD's flagship operation, it was also the oldest active copper smelter in the country. The company refused to spend money on pollution control at what it saw as an increasingly outdated facility. As pressure from regulators built, Local activists held rallies and publicized the myriad health impacts of living near a smelter. Haltingly, Mexican-American leaders, particularly those who had fought the company in 1983, began to side with environmentalists. Unbeknownst to both environmentalists and former workers, though, PD had been looking for a reason to close its Douglas operations all along. Relocating the plant in another state 
would cut labor costs further while avoiding the price of modernizing operations in Douglas. Pressure from environmentalists simply gave PD a convenient scapegoat for his actions. On Monday, January 12th, 1987, the smelter's 24 towering ore roasters began to cool. Its three great reverberatory furnaces followed. On Wednesday, crane operators transferred the last crucible of mat into the smelter's last operating converter, giving the assembled crew its last display of showering sparks and hissing gas. Workers skimmed and dumped slag off the converter top for a few more hours, and then, with sullen ceremony, poured a last fluid line of copper into molds. They returned home as they had always done at the end of their shift. The town was never the same again. The firing of union workers and the relocation of white collar jobs in the early 1980s had inflicted the worst damage already. Still, the blow of the final closure was significant. Douglas's mayor estimated it cost the town another 347 jobs and a quarter of its remaining economic base. New prison construction, the perpetual hope of poor rural towns, would offset the losses, he promised. And it did, in a small way. But Douglas was, simply put, no longer a place of industry. Economic restructuring had gutted the town as thoroughly as Rust Belt, Scranton, or Pittsburgh. A decade after the smelter closed, about 40% of the population lived below the poverty line and those were the people who remained. By the time Ida began third grade in her new American home, many of the town's residents had already left. School became Ida's refuge and Cynthia became her shadow. Ida's younger sister entered second grade as Ida herself entered third. Cynthia had grown quiet since the move and she followed Ida everywhere. She was not the only shy kid following Ida. The second and third grade classes at Sarah Marley had a contingent of new kids who, like Ida and Cynthia, had just come over from Agua Prieta. They fell in together. Outside the vortex of home, Ida had a way of making people feel included and loved. But that wasn't the only thing that endeared her to the other kids from Agua Prieta. All the wrenching changes in her life had reformed her body into something formidable. Her baby fat cheeks and dimpled smile disguised a boxer's physique and a direct line to fury. No one bullied the new kids when she was around. In the classroom, however, some teachers punished Ida and her new friends for speaking Spanish. Others just ignored them. In Ida's language arts class, students took turns reading passages out loud, but the teacher skipped over Ida every time. Maybe he was well-meaning. Perhaps he thought it saved her from embarrassment. But getting passed over day (coughs) after day felt intolerably cruel to Ida. So she determined that she would learn English as fast as she could. Ida listened closely to her teachers and peers, echoing under her breath anything they said. She turned strange words over and over in her mouth until her lips and tongue finally made them sound correct. At home, She copied out bits of movie dialogue and song lyrics. Her English got better, but still she struggled. Ida Hernandez, you get punished quite a lot for speaking Spanish, don't you? A teacher challenged her one day. Yes, Mrs. Villagas. Mrs. Villagas figured in the legends of Sarah Marley as an awe-inspiring, poofy-haired tyrant. Her face had been stuck in a permanent scowl for the entire two decades since her giant eyeglasses had been fashionable. Ida's instinct was to run, but the teacher's look intervened. Come by my classroom after school today. Don't be late. That afternoon, after the last bell, Ida dragged her feet into the lair of the one teacher even the greenest kid from Mexico knew not to cross. Cynthia followed behind, keeping a cautious distance in case of trouble. Do you know what this is, Miss Hernandez? Mrs. Villagas pointed to a stack of blue plastic binders on her desk. Ida knew. Anyone who watched TV or listened to the radio in Spanish at any point in the 1990s recognized a box set of Inglés Sin Barreras, the gold standard of immigrant dreams. It was the blueprint to success, the secret key that unlocked promotions, new cars, 
suburban homes, and beautiful blonde girlfriends. I bought this, Mrs. Viaga said, with my own money. If you'd like to study English after school, I'll be here every day. At home, everything about the way Raul had been slashed out of the family confused Aida. Jennifer knew more than she'd say about the reasons for leaving Aguapeta, but she refused to answer Aida's questions. The oldest sister had struggled with her transition to an American middle school. She began to ditch more classes than she attended. Days spent with her friends extended into late nights out. Sometimes she didn't return home at all. Cynthia, for her part, stayed physically close to Aida, but grew quieter and more serious. Aida, Jennifer, and Cynthia were still the three musketeers, closer than any three people they knew, but a hairline crack had opened between them. When Saul went back to his real family, the household breathed again, but the bruises remained. Aida noticed that her mother hadn't sung since they arrived in Arizona. They said her puerto had become too sad. In simpler times, when she lived in Aguaprieta and her mom had scolded one of the three sisters, the other two would tiptoe up behind Luz. They'd make clown faces and fish lips, doing their best to get the girl in trouble to crack up. What are you laughing at, little girl? Luz would scream in Spanish, while the other two sisters tried not to laugh out loud. But when they lived in Mexico, Luz's fire didn't burn as hot, and her anger would eventually fizzle into good humor. Now they knew better than to even try it. Ida watched her mother disappear from them as completely as her father had. Luz stopped waking the girls up for school in the morning and no longer checked their homework every afternoon. And as Jennifer quickly realized, Luz stopped keeping track of whether they went to school at all. Ida helped take over the cooking. She changed Emiliano and Jasmine's diapers and gave them bottles at night. As Jasmine got older, Ida spent hours combing her hair and making pretty pigtails with Polita's eyes. Ida might run off to school with her volcanic black curls in disarray, but her little sister would be beautiful, she vowed. At school, Ida, Cynthia, and Mrs. Viagas worked together for an hour every day. Soon the whole group of Aguapieta exiles joined them. English fell into place that year in a way nothing ever had before in Ida's life. Her language arts teacher still skipped her during group reading, but the kids from Aguapeta didn't get punished as much, and that filled Ida with pride. One day, when the language arts teacher asked the student on Ida's left to read, and then pointed to the student on Ida's right to take the next passage, Ida saw her chance. She raised her hand and said, Please, sir, may I read? The teacher looked dumbstruck, then smiled. Ida read the short passage and then kept going to the next one and the next one. Finally, she stumbled on a word. Tiny came out teeny. Tiny, the teacher said, correcting her. Tiny, Ida repeated. In her mind, the kids around her cheered. That spring, as the school year came to a close, Ida's homeroom teacher printed a certificate of superior achievement and excellence of performance for her. She ran home to show her mother and vowed to save the diploma forever. Delighting in their new command of English, Ida and Cynthia devised a routine to make their mother laugh. They stood next to her speaking their new language, the one Luce only half understood. Cynthia, I have a big secret. Whatever you do, don't tell mom. Ida would begin. Okay, I promise, I won't tell mom. Tell me your big secret. The two girls said these lines with poorly suppressed giggles and exaggerated winks. Luce didn't take the bait. The joke hit too close to her essential vulnerability. Her daughters could escape to school nine months of the year, but Luce, undocumented with little English, dependent on a violent and controlling man and struggling to keep a household of five growing kids afloat, was all alone. Lou spent long hours manning the dispatch radio and cleaning Saul's fleet of vehicles. Working from home let her take care of Emiliano and Jasmine during the day, but it also meant that she rarely went out. Luz needed Saul's permission to leave the house, and he'd know if she disobeyed him. He and his fleet of drivers kept close track of her movements. Just lending a garden hose to a male neighbor 
could provoke a fight that ended with Saul threatening to cut off financial support. Luce had a U.S. citizen sister in Douglas whom she could have visited without incurring Saul's wrath, but that would have required explaining her bruises. There were only so many times she could say the hood of a car fell on her while she was checking the oil, so she rarely saw her sister, Camilla's mother. Douglas wasn't yet saturated with U.S. Border Patrol and police, as it would be in the coming years. But Luce was sharply aware of her tenuous status. The border crossing card she showed at the Douglas Port of Entry on March 8, 1996, was valid for visits of up to 72 hours within 25 miles of the border. It was meant to allow Mexican consumers to sustain Arizona's retail economy, not to live in the state. Saul never let her forget this. Her legal status loomed behind every threat he made. Shut up, you stupid woman, or I'll call the border patrol, he'd say. Sure, go ahead and call the police. They'll bring the border patrol, and it won't be me they'll take away. Be quiet, he'd scold the girls if they got too loud. The police will come, and they'll call the border patrol to take you away. On good days, Saul promised to help Luz fix her papers. Part of her wanted to believe this. The other part knew he already had a legal wife. So she took precautions. When Saul moved them to a new apartment, Luz found a hiding place for each of her children. She tried to turn it into a game. One, two, three, go hide. The migra is here, she would call out, and the kids would scatter to their places. This, like so much else, passed as normal in Ida's new home. Her mother's escape from Raul had lifted her roughly from one country and set her down hard in another. But most people Ida knew had family on both sides. Crossing the border could be difficult or dangerous for migrants from farther south in Mexico or Central America, but border folk, acculturated to binational living, still moved back and forth with relative ease. They carried themselves differently from other immigrants. Many traced their family's presence in this part of the world to a time before the border existed. They had local knowledge that allowed them to pass, as long as, and only if, they were lucky and stayed out of trouble. Ida internalized her mother's frequent reminders. Keep quiet, don't make trouble. To a certain degree, her mother's habit of looking over her shoulder was contagious. Ida understood that she couldn't participate in certain after-school activities, and even the simplest trip to a store with her mom was a nervous sprint. But eventually, Ida would stop thinking much about her immigration status. On her own, away from her mother, Ida roamed freely through Douglas. If she had a dollar, she could go to the Circle K across the street to buy 10 mini Reese's peanut butter cups. Even very young, she babysat for neighbors. Most women in the apartment complex knew or intuited the nature of Ida's home life. They were too afraid of Saul to intervene when he got violent, but they could take Ida into their homes, feed her, and occasionally give her used clothes. An older housebound neighbor asked her to take out her garbage every evening. Each time she did it, the woman let Ida take a pomegranate from her tree, a thing of pure joy. Ida would sit on her stoop, break the fruit in half, and drench herself in the ruby juice. It was the summer of 1997, and when Sarah Marley Elementary started again in the fall, Ida knew several different routes to school. She could admire 99 cent earrings in the stores on Chi Avenue, and she could shine all of her nine and three quarter year old charm on shop clerks. When Ida smiled, even the most suspicious of them stopped puttering over racks of boots and rhinestone jeans long enough to find a cardboard box that Ida could play with. They'd give her unwanted boxes and she'd drag stacks of them to the apartment courtyard. There, she and her friends could transform them into labyrinths and forts. Douglas's big box stores marked the western edge of Ida's U.S. geography. Memorial Park with its pool and F-16 Falcon on a pedestal was her east. Hurtleville and the Casita, where the family first landed after fleeing Mexico, the north. To the south, she could see the old chain-link border fence clearly. Agua Prieta hummed a thousand grown-up steps from her doorstep, but she had begun to forget the other city at the end of her street. Underneath it all, 
Ida and her friends discovered a network of municipal storm tunnels. They would wait for Border Patrol shift changes and dash into the gaping mouth of the underworld. The tunnels were big enough in places for the kids to ride their bicycles, and at a spot deep inside the system, Ida staked her shy claim to the new world. Ida Hernandez was here. She scratched in English on the concrete wall. On Thursday nights, like everyone else, she watched Friends. If she slept well that night, she would dream that she was in Friends and she'd wake up happy. She was a part of America. Despite abundant evidence of Douglas's rough expulsion from the promise of middle-class life, Ida trusted her adopted country's dream. When she and her sisters talked about the future, she proclaimed a vision that was only slightly different from the one she had announced in the playground across the border. When I grow up, she said in a voice that had hardened a bit in 18 months, I am not going to have a husband. I am not going to have any kids. I'm going to live in the biggest building in New York in an all white apartment, just me and my all white cat. Three. A sudden storm. August 1997. It had been a week of storms in the arid southwest. The previous night's rain, more than three inches in two hours, washed the sky clean and teased a feathering of green out of the Ochre Mountains. Rosie Mendoza had lived in Douglas and Agua Prieta for 12 years, but even on a day that clear and beautiful, the Sonoran Desert didn't feel like home. Returning to Douglas after a meeting with Mexican health officials, she observed the effects of the previous night's liquid destruction. Four inches of standing water remained in places around the port of entry. Trash and brush clogged streets. The ditch running 10 blocks along the international line and under the port of entry was swollen with muddy runoff. She had spent the happiest years of her childhood in a tropical estuary on Mexico's Pacific coast, a paradise of palms and mangroves. Prone to biblical analogies, she called her time on the border her 40 years in the desert. Rosie's true home was a green place where water lay thick and slow on the land. Water in the desert, when it came at all, was swift and angry. Like many newcomers getting their first glimpse of the Sulphur Springs Valley, Rosie had cried when her bus from Hermosillo crested the high point outside Agua Prieta back in 1985. On that day, a blue-gray cloud billowed out of the twin smelter stacks across the border in Arizona. Sulphur haze gloamed beneath it, and because the wind blew just right, black fly ash swirled in eddies around <coughs> her bus. Rosie had not wanted to be on that bus, but foreign factories had begun to open along the border and she needed a job. Rosie was 17 when she arrived in Agua Prieta. She had worked full time since the end of sixth grade. As a girl, she had labored in agricultural fields and helped her grandfather, an indigenous healer. As a teen, she had packed frozen chicken parts at a slaughterhouse. At 16, she used her savings to build her mother a house. When the chicken plant closed for a strike, she set out for the border in search of a new job. Rosie had arrived in Agua Prieta on a Sunday. By Tuesday, she had a job at a Japanese factory. For 10 hours a day, she worked with solvents that dissolved her fingerprints and scorched her nasal passages. But the work allowed her to send money to her mom, and Rosie felt as if she were doing something real. She was making a new product that few people on either side of the border had heard of yet. It was an automobile computer system that inflated a fabric cushion to protect drivers in the event of a collision. Airbags, they were called. On her days off, Rosie crossed into Arizona without papers to harvest chilies, apples, peaches, and pistachios. In those seasons before walls and checkpoints, it was easy for workers to cycle between farm labor in the United States and homes in Mexico. When Ronald Reagan signed the Immigration Reform and Control Act, IRCA, in 1986, Rosie lucked out. The bill allowed farm workers like her to become legal residents in the United States. She settled in Douglas, married, divorced, and raised five children alone. 
Somehow, she managed to put herself through college. Like her grandfather before her, she became a healer. Her title might have been social worker, health promoter, or victim's advocate, but she was a healer and a force of nature. At first, Rosie had worked on any project that seemed urgent. She conducted HIV testing and diabetes education and taught Douglas residents how to protect themselves from heavy metal residues. Eventually, she would focus on sexual assault and domestic violence, topics she knew firsthand. Much later, that work would bring Rosie and Ida together in a crucial moment. But on that August day in 1997, early in her career, she worked in drug abuse prevention. Her meeting with Mexican officials that morning had gone well. They'd discussed ways to coordinate U.S. and Mexican efforts. Like storms, the issues Rosie cared about didn't respect national borders. Walking back to her office in Douglas, Rosie found a crowd milling around the international line. At the end of July, Border Patrol agents had removed sections of ramshackle chain link between Douglas and Agua Prieta. Everyone agreed that the fence, segments of which dated to the 1950s, was useless, but the Border Patrol's work stirred uneasy feelings. In place of the fence, they planned to erect an 18-foot-high barrier of iron bollards along the border. It would stretch a mile to the east and a quarter mile to the west of the port of entry, an ugly barricade cobbled from Gulf War surplus helicopter landing mats would extend beyond that. Together, they would constitute the most substantial barrier ever installed in this stretch of the Southwest. Rosie and her friends from Douglas's churches and community groups feared the divisive message the wall would send. For weeks since the old fence came down, Mexican citizens had gathered to chat with Border Patrol agents welding sections of the new barrier. Sweltering in the August heat, agents strayed across the line to buy popsicles and cold drinks from Mexican vendors. But the crowd on the morning of August 6 was bigger. More than 100 people lined the Mexican side of the border, pushing right to the crumbly precipice. They spoke in low, angry voices. A woman stood off to the side, praying the rosary. Rosie bumped through the crowd, Short and round with wavy hair and apple cheeks, she found that her warm sorries and excuse me's opened a pathway. She could see yellow police tape on the U.S. side of the ditch. Below, she saw city workers waiting in the receding water. Some wore hazmat suits. Douglas's police chief, Charlie Austin, looked grimmer than Rosie had ever seen him. Someone in the crowd explained that the Americans had found four bodies in the ditch that morning. One of them, a man, had been pried from the mud just below where Rosie stood. He had come out purple and swollen. Fine gray silt clogged his eyes, nose, and mouth. Like most professionals who saw extremes of human suffering on a daily basis, Rosie believed that she could not sustain her work without strong defenses. She rarely allowed herself to feel even a fraction of the suffering she saw, and she almost never spoke about the violence she had lived through herself. She helped other people process their emotions and kept her own in check. That morning, though, something gave way. In the 1980s and early 1990s, migrant deaths on the border near Douglas had been rare. This was clearly changing. The number of bodies recovered in the ditch after the previous night's storm would eventually reach eight, equal to the number of border crossers who died in the entire 260-mile Tucson Border Patrol sector during all of 1995. No one knew it yet, but the migrants who drowned in this storm were among the first of thousands who would die in the coming years. No one in the crowd could imagine that future. But staring into the muddy ditch, Rosie felt it looming. A jolt of apprehension propelled her out of the crowd. She ran west along the ditch, looking for a quiet spot away from people. Fifty yards from the port of entry, a bundle of cloth caught her eye, and she stopped short. It looked like a burlap sack floating in an eddy, except when she focused, she saw that the fabric had arms and legs 
Standing on the U.S. side, Charlie Austin reckoned that the procession of distended bodies coming out of the ditch was the worst thing he'd seen in 24 years as a police officer. Circumspect in speech and angular in bearing, Douglas's police chief appeared cut from the same cloth as Wyatt Earp. In fact, he'd grown up in Bisbee, just up the highway from the O.K. Corral. He squinted at the scene. His sun-blasted face reveals little of the anger he felt. The police chief was a law and order conservative, a Christian pastor, and a decent guy. He wanted things to make sense, and nothing about that day made sense. As far as he was concerned, the border was a homicide crime scene, with the number of victims growing by the hour. He just didn't know whom to charge. In the coming weeks, Charlie concluded that the deaths were easy to reconstruct, but hard to explain. Late on August 5th, 12 migrants had met for dinner at a restaurant in Agua Prieta. En route from central and southern Mexico, they were new to the border and full of nervous anticipation. They ate what they could, and the man each of them had paid to guide them to Phoenix reviewed the plan. Then he led them into the night. The group slipped into the ditch and hurried west along the border, feeling lucky. The fence had been removed, and Border Patrol's night vision cameras didn't work well in the light drizzle that had started to fall. At the end of F Avenue, they located the mouth of a cement storm sewer. They were to follow the tunnel 10 blocks north to a manhole opening. If the coast was clear, the smuggler told them, they'd crawl out and make their way to a motel a few blocks from the exit. They walked, stooped over, and made good progress. Above them, the rain picked up, and they were grateful to be undercover. At 9th Street and F Avenue, almost directly under the apartment where Ida lived at the time, the 12 migrants and their smuggler paused. A metal ladder bolted to the tunnel wall, climbed to a graded opening. Ahead of them, the passage narrowed. On dry days, Ida and her friends used to sneak into this tunnel to play. She had joyously scratched her name somewhere in the concrete vault, but these people just wanted out. Above them, they could hear the rain intensify. Torrents of water battered into asphalt and cement-hard desert. The sound of a train rumbled somewhere in the distance. There was no time to react. The water hit them before their brains could register the improbability of hearing a train in a storm sewer. Those who grabbed the metal ladder lived. Those who didn't died. The flash flood swept the unlucky ones away, banging them out of the tunnel into the ditch and around the corner. At the end of the run, the current pinned them against a metal grate in a tangle of debris where the culvert dived under the port of entry. Four adults and a two-year-old girl clung to the ladder for more than two hours. The grate above them was jammed or locked, so they squeezed into the shaft as water pounded below. They were battered and cold, but managed to hold on until the flood receded. Bleeding and hypothermic, the survivors staggered to the Loma Douglas Motel, the smuggler among them. At this point, he was probably calculating the scrutiny the deaths would ignite. He dumped the group at the motel with a threat. Keep quiet about what happened in the tunnel. Then he disappeared. Early on the morning of the 6th, the port director, Frank Amarillas, inspected the clogged grate. It had almost flooded his facility the night before. Shining his flashlight at the black water, he saw what he thought was a bale of marijuana floating amid the debris. A smuggler had abandoned his load in the storm, Amarillas thought. It happened often enough. He called for a pole and pulled the bale to shore. From close up, though, even in the dark, he could see that it wasn't a bale. It was a woman. At 8.30 that morning, Douglas City workers found the bodies of three men. The man that Rosie saw lifted out of the mud was a fifth victim. A sixth man's body appeared a few hours later, and Border Patrol agents detained the survivors huddled in their motel room alone. On August 17th, a second summer monsoon rearranged the ditch bottom again, and two more bodies surfaced. 
In total, seven men and one woman, ages 18 to 34, had died. It was not the first time migrants had died crossing the border between Agua Prieta and Douglas, but it was the first time so many had died at once, right in the middle of town. And the dead were from distant central Mexico, strangers even in a place accustomed to the movement of people. Their sudden and public deaths shook both sides of the line. Charlie Austin wanted to charge the smuggler with manslaughter, but the man had vanished. Besides, Charlie felt that there was something more to the story. It wasn't just a single event. Anyone paying attention could see that migrants were crossing the border in greater numbers every day and were taking bigger and bigger risks to do so. They were coming from distant Mexican states that people in Douglas and Agua Prieta barely knew existed. They were not following the familiar patterns of migration the region had known for years. Why were so many migrants, with destinations deep in the interior United States, streaming through this place, which had previously mostly seen short-term seasonal migrants? Why were people from far away central and southern Mexico passing through Douglas? A young reporter, Javier Zaragoza, found himself asking the same questions. Part of the last generation of Douglas residents to attend college on smelter wages Javier had made it to the Ivy League. He had studied journalism at Brown and had returned to Douglas to take his first real job in his chosen career. On August 6th, he had slipped past Charlie's police tape for a closer look at the scene. His work at the Douglas Dispatch wasn't scheduled to start for two more weeks, but Javier was eager. Over the following months, whenever he asked friends to explain the new face of migration, they gave absurd answers. The most common response ran something like, you know, Mexicans, always having babies. More thoughtful observers blamed the massive influx of migrants on economic crises in Mexico. During the 1980s and early 1990s, foreign investors and the International Monetary Fund had praised the country's pro-market policies. Economic liberalization had generated an expanding financial system attracted foreign investment, and birthed a growing cadre of Mexican billionaires. At the same time, the Washington-approved policies left many Mexicans far behind, and in 1994 and 1995, a financial collapse triggered by international currency speculators sent poverty and unemployment rates skyrocketing. By August 1997, the meltdown had pushed many Mexicans to seek work in the North. Agricultural provisions of NAFTA, combined with the collapse of international coffee markets, displaced millions more. As dire as those crises were, though, they did not explain why a wave of migration had come crashing down on Douglas, 120 miles of empty desert from the nearest major U.S. city. Javier eventually found the solution to this puzzle by talking with friends in the Border Patrol. Charlie Austin learned the answer at a briefing with federal officials. After the meeting, Charlie fumed. Why hadn't anyone bothered to inform local law enforcement? Was the Border Patrol that arrogant or just clueless about the impact of its actions? Both Javier and Charlie remembered the words of an Anglo rancher who conveyed everyone's frustration at a town hall meeting with federal officials. You mean you fucking planned this? Indeed, what Javier, Charlie, Rosie, the Anglo rancher, and even nine-year-old Iva witnessed was planned in a way. The crisis in Douglas was the logical outcome of policies crafted far from the border with little regard for life on the border. It was just the latest in a long history of policies driven by political interests, divorced from the real dynamics of migration and this place. The border between Douglas and Agua Prieta was established by treaty in 1854. For more than a half century after that, no policies had limited migration from Mexico. In 1917, Congress imposed morality tests and visa fees on entrance from Mexico. Even then, border officials enforced the new rules irregularly. In Douglas, they made little effort to prevent people from avoiding hassles by walking around the official border crossing. 
Even as xenophobia and the eugenics movement reached frenzied levels in the 1920s and 1930s, lawmakers still imposed no numerical limits on migration from Mexico. Amid seething nativism during that period, Congress created an explicitly racist immigration quota system. The Immigration Act of 1924 barred people defined as non-white from immigrating to the United States and severely restricted immigration by supposedly inferior whites from Southern and Eastern Europe. On top of that, federal representatives passed legislation designed to make life difficult for undesirable immigrants already in the country. But those laws targeted Asian, African, and Southern and Eastern European immigrants. Lawmakers explicitly excluded Mexicans and other Western Hemisphere residents from the new quotas. Flows of Latin American migrants across the Southwest border were simply understood as an integral part of the economy and society of the region. To be sure, bias still affected the treatment of Mexicans seeking entry to the United States. Border officials harassed and intimidated dark-skinned crossers. When would-be Mexican immigrants looked poor, agents deployed morality standards and entry fee rules to prevent them from crossing. And during outbursts of racial and economic animus in the 1930s and 1950s, federal and local officials staged mass expulsions of both Mexican immigrants and U.S. citizens of Mexican descent. These purges, carried out with dubious tactics and disregard for immigration law, affected hundreds of thousands of people and separated countless families. Nevertheless, U.S. law imposed no numerical limits on legal immigration from Mexico, and the border was essentially open. When laws did restrict commerce between Douglas and Agua Vida, smuggling often ensued. Cattle thieves had plied their trade across the border in both directions since the border was drawn, and from 1910 to 1920, U.S. merchants trafficked guns and ammunition to all sides in the Mexican Revolution. During the U.S. Prohibition era, clandestine traffic again flourished. And in the 1980s and early 1990s, the escalating drug war again spawned an industry of border evasion. In 1990, authorities in Douglas discovered the first narco tunnel. Built by El Chapo Guzman's Sinaloa cartel, it was more elaborate than the municipal sewers later used by migrant smugglers. It came complete with electric lighting and a trolley for ferrying cocaine 270 feet under the border. At its Agua Peta end, a hydraulic system raised a pool table in a luxury home's game room to reveal the tunnel's secret entrance. On a day-to-day -day basis though, movement across the border, legal or not, was an open and undramatic affair. Baby boomers still tell stories of the time when children's games crisscrossed the wire. At the end of a hot day of Sandlot baseball in Douglas, legend had it, kids from Agua Peta would turn themselves into the border patrol. Agents would give each child a popsicle and a ride back to the port of entry. The story was probably apocryphal and definitely romanticized, but it captured an attitude that was fully real. On any given day, Douglas residents ducked through the fence to buy pan dulce and tortillas in Mexico. Business owners from Agua Peta dashed across to visit their barber. They could have crossed officially through the port of entry, but why bother with the inconvenience? Ironically, it was a set of liberal reforms that ended the era of relatively free movement across the U.S.-Mexico border. During the mid-1960s civil rights era, images of segregated schools and sadistic Southern sheriffs tarnished the United States image abroad. It had become difficult to convince potential Cold War allies in Africa, Asia, and Latin America that the United States' promise of freedom and equality wasn't hollow to the core. The fact that the country preserved an overtly racist system of immigration quotas didn't help. So in 1965, sitting in ceremony at the Statue of Liberty, President Lyndon Johnson signed sweeping immigration reforms into law. No longer would racial restrictions govern immigration policy. Each country in the Eastern Hemisphere would now receive 20,000 immigration visas a year. African and Asian nations would be eligible for the exact same quota as Germany or Norway. 
Southern and Eastern European countries would also receive the same. Equality had come at last to U.S. immigration policy. There was just one problem. The new system was fairer for residents of Madagascar and Indonesia, countries whose residents had been barred from immigrating to the United States on racial grounds. But what about Mexico, whose residents had engaged in relatively unimpeded migration to the United States since before the border existed? Countries with little history of migration to the United States received the same quota as countries defined by back and forth flows of people. Most recently, millions of Mexicans had answered the call to pick the United States food and help run its railroads during World War II. The Bracero program, which gave wartime migrants from Mexico temporary work permits, was so successful that Congress extended it for two decades after VJ Day. By the time the Bracero program ended in 1965, the United States and Mexico had become interdependent in ways that few observers on either side of the border wanted to acknowledge. In the years leading up to 1965, as many as half a million Mexican migrants cycled annually through the United States. With a functioning guest worker program and unlimited immigrant visas available to Mexican petitioners, almost all of those migrants had legal status. The sudden and dramatic change arrived as a one-two punch. First, the 1965 law imposed an unprecedented numerical cap on legal immigration from Western Hemisphere countries. In the years preceding the reform, some 250,000 to 500,000 Mexican migrants cycled legally through the United States. Now no more than 120,000 legal immigrants from the entire Western Hemisphere would be permitted. The 1965 law stopped short, however, of extending the 20,000 visas per country quota to Latin America and Canada. Mexico could at least claim a big share of the Western Hemisphere's allotment. That changed in 1976, when Congress amended the original reform bill, extending the 20,000 visas per country limit to the Western Hemisphere. After 1976, all countries would be eligible for the exact same number of immigrant visas. The new, fairer system gave Mexico the same quota as Luxembourg or Bhutan. In subsequent years, Congress closed America's front door further with reductions in the total number of immigrants admitted illegally to the United States. Thus, between 1968 and 1980, the number of visas available to Mexican immigrants plunged from virtually unlimited to 20,000 or fewer. Parents, spouses, and minor children of U.S. citizens could be admitted over the cap, but new rules made family sponsorship more difficult. Did the United States and Mexico respond to this restriction on legal migration by turning their backs on 200 years of connection and deeply interwoven lives? Did family ties binding the United States and Mexico vanish? Did industries dependent on cross-border movements of people disappear? They did not. Migration continued as it always had, but all of a sudden, the same Mexicans who had come and gone from the country legally were now doing so without permission. When Lyndon Johnson signed the 1965 law, Border Patrol agents arrested around 40,000 immigrants a year. By the late 1970s, this figure would skyrocket to between 330,000 and 460,000. Media outlets observed the phenomenon with a growing sense of panic. Many likened it to an unexpected natural disaster. The United States had been hit by a flood of Mexicans without papers, a tidal wave of illegals. In fact, the explosion of Mexicans crossing the border without permission was entirely predictable. It was the inevitable consequence of policies that slashed opportunities to migrate legally without addressing the forces pushing and pulling people across the line. People who had lived their lives across two countries legally and peacefully for decades were suddenly redefined as invaders and threats. The illegal immigrant was thus invented in Washington, D.C., conjured out of contradiction. To make matters worse, the dramatic reduction in options for legal immigration from Mexico came just before the 1980s debt crisis hurled the United States 
southern neighbor into the worst economic recession in its history and intensified pressures on Mexicans to look for jobs in the North. By the mid-1980s, the fundamental contradiction in U.S. immigration policy had spawned an even more complicated dilemma. Millions of people who lived, raised their children, attended school, paid taxes, opened businesses, sustained local economies, went to church, and joined the military in the United States, now lived in the shadow of illegality. Part of the fabric of life in the United States and yet denied formal membership, they were citizens without citizenship. In 1986, President Ronald Reagan signed the Bipartisan Immigration Reform and Control Act, later condemned by anti-immigration activists as amnesty for illegals IRCA attempted to undo problems set in motion by the 1965 reform. Under the bill, undocumented immigrants who met strict criteria could become formal members of their national community. Nearly three million people received green cards thanks to the 1986 law. 70% of them were originally from Mexico. At the same time, the bill imposed criminal penalties on employers who hired undocumented immigrants. It also provided an at the time unprecedented increase in border security funding. With these three components in place, legalization, employer sanctions, and border security, Reagan hoped to end the era of citizens without citizenship. Undocumented people already working in the United States would gain legal permanent resident status, while a newly minted focus on enforcement would prevent other people from following in their footsteps. Rosie Mendoza was one of the 2.7 million undocumented immigrants who benefited from IRCA. Ida Hernandez was one of the many millions more whose presence in the United States after IRCA exemplified the law's failure. The era of citizens without citizenship could not be addressed by simply providing legal status to one cohort of immigrants and then trying to seal the border behind them. Fueled by debt crisis in Mexico and expanding demand for low-wage workers in the United States, undocumented migration continued through the rest of the 1980s. In the mid-1990s, new financial crises in Mexico sent even more people in search of livelihoods. Rising inequality in the United States drove migration as well. As the U.S. rich got richer, demand for nannies, gardeners, and construction workers soared. Meanwhile, easily exploitable immigrant labor helped keep down the prices of goods and services that middle-class Americans counted on, even as their share of the economic pie shrank. All of these forces combined to push undocumented migration to unprecedented highs. IRCA's failure was evident to all, and yet the political will to address the problem had vanished. As a result, a girl like Ida, growing up American, attending school, speaking English, and staying out of trouble, had virtually no possibility of gaining legal residence. Anti-immigrant vigilantes who poured into Douglas in the coming years could scream, get in line as much as they liked. There was no line for Ida to get into. Douglas and Aguapieta remained largely insulated from the emerging crisis. Ida and her family aside, most of the growing numbers of long-term migrants braving the U.S.-Mexico border in the early to mid-1990s bypassed the remote town. Even as El Paso, San Diego, and other large border cities reported overwhelming influxes, Douglas remained more or less unchanged. Migration through Douglas was still a modest affair. Until 1997, that is, when a sudden storm rolled into town. At this point, the rancher's question bears repeating. You mean you fucking planned this. Unbeknownst to nearly everyone in Douglas, a new enforcement paradigm had come to the border. It debuted in September 1993, when the El Paso Border Patrol Sector Chief, Sylvester Reyes, pulled agents off mobile patrols. Breaking with tradition, he concentrated his agents in a static line along a short stretch of the urban Rio Grande. Reyes believed that shutting off unauthorized border crossing in convenient urban areas would force migrants into more difficult terrain. This would raise the human and economic cost of crossing. 
Reasoning like a microeconomist, Reyes figured that increasing the cost of crossing would lead to fewer people trying. Veteran agents, partial to the thrill of a good chase, hated sedentary days spent sitting on their exes. But the strategy worked. Or half of it did. Thanks to Operation Hold the Line, apprehensions of undocumented border crossers fell by 76% in El Paso. The price charged by smugglers soared. Shunted into dangerous wilderness, migrants crossing the border began to die in unprecedented numbers. The program appeared a resounding success. In 1994, officials in San Diego implemented their own version of the strategy, dubbing it Operation Gatekeeper. There, too, the number of unauthorized crossings plummeted. And yet, prevention through deterrence, as the strategy came to be called, had little effect on the total number of crossings. Instead, like a pincer moving west from Texas and east from California, it funneled unauthorized border crossings straight into Arizona. The state had some of the deadliest terrain on the border, and only a fraction of Texas's and California's electoral college votes. Steering a continent's worth of immigrants into the hot Sonoran desert made cold political sense. The impact on Arizona could be addressed easily, officials argued, by extending prevention through deterrence to Nogales and Douglas. Meanwhile, the political dividends paid out. In the mid-1990s, Rahm Emanuel, then senior advisor to Bill Clinton, urged the president to take back political ground lost to tough-on-crime Republicans. He suggested a spectacular show of force against undocumented immigration. Clinton scrawled, I agree, and this is great in the margin of one of Emmanuel's memos. Sylvester Reyes's gambit in El Paso provided a perfect model for this political theater. Unbroken chains of agents watching over deserted urban border crossings made for spectacular photo opportunities. Migrants still crossed the border in growing numbers, of course, but they did so in remote landscapes, much harder for cameras and citizens to see. The appearance of success attracted money in previously unimaginable quantities. Mushrooming budgets and an energetic new sense of purpose transformed the Border Patrol. Elaborate fences, high-tech surveillance equipment, and thousands of new agents turned the ad hoc strategy into a permanent stance. For decades, the Border Patrol had been a bit player in the pantheon of federal law enforcement. By the turn of the millennium, it was quickly becoming the largest and most heavily funded federal police force in the United States. In November 1996, Sylvester Reyes rode his success all the way to Washington, D.C., where he would serve as Democratic Congressman for Texas's 16th District. And by the summer of 1997, the funnel effect he set in motion hit Douglas like a wall of water. In 1999, Smugglers charged $150 a head for passage from Agua Prieta to Phoenix. A year later, the cost ranged from $800 to $1,300. As predicted, the new Border Patrol strategy made clandestine border crossing more dangerous as well. Deaths from exposure, dehydration, hypothermia, and injury soared in and around Douglas. Whereas migrant death had once been a disturbing anomaly, Individual incidents began to lose some of their power to shock residents, but not always. In July 1999, the young reporter Javier Zaragoza snapped a photograph for the Douglas Dispatch that reminded many readers of August 1997. In the photo, a raging flood pins a man inside a graded tunnel entrance. Three firefighters heroically roped against the torrent, prepare to cut the bars. They saved the trapped man. Three other migrants were wedged through the grate by the force of the storm that day. They ran aground in the ditch, bloody and pummeled, but alive. And still people crossed in greater and greater numbers. Four, miles of wall and no time to sleep. Luz announced a trip to the dollar store across Pan American Avenue, eight blocks from their latest apartment. Ida and Cynthia streaked out the door, itching for freedom. 
The sidewalk was gritty with gravel under their sneakers. They kicked up stones and flew across heat-warped streets. Luce hustled behind, looking left and right, eyeing the scene, looking for danger. Don't run, girls, she yelled after them in Spanish. They ignored her and she called again, and then once more, angry for real now. Aida, Cynthia, if you run, the migra will think that you're mojaditas. The sisters, ten and eight years old, scuffed to an exaggerated slow motion stop. Giggling, they switched to speed walking, not dainty swift steps, but giant hungry strides embellished with feigned toil. Their conspiracy to obey the letter and not the spirit of their mother's law amused them. Except for Pan American up ahead with its steady flow of traffic to and from the port of entry, the streets were silent. Still young enough not to care, the girls did not take their mother's warning seriously, but they had noticed the changes. In 1999, Border Patrol detained an average of 24,000 migrants a month in and around the girls' new hometown. By early 2000, agents were detaining 30,000 migrants a month, almost double the population of Douglas itself. Migrants caught and returned to Mexico simply tried again the next night. Even Central Americans flown back to their home countries typically returned. Frustrated agents employed more brutal tactics, perhaps hoping that increased cruelty would deter repeat border crossing. Agents destroyed water bottles placed in the desert by humanitarian aid workers, stripped detainees of their money and possessions, denied them access to legal counsel, and withheld food and medical care. To disorient and terrorize, Border Patrol sometimes separated women from their groups and deported them late at night and alone into strange cities. To sow fear, agents would separate families. They would deport some members of a family to one border city and the others to cities hundreds or thousands of miles away. In theory, children were never separated from their guardians through this kind of lateral repatriation, but it happened. A 13-year-old girl might find herself abandoned and alone in Nogales, while agents dumped the rest of her family in Tijuana. Meanwhile, angry politicians made immigration enforcement in the interior of the country more punitive. Backed by President Bill Clinton and approved by a Republican Congress, the 1996 Anti-Terrorism and Effective Death Penalty Act, AEDPA, and Illegal Immigration Reform and Immigrant Responsibility Act, IIRIRA, brought tough-on-crime tactics to civil, non-criminal immigration proceedings. The two laws dramatically expanded the range of offenses that disqualified immigrants from legal status. They restricted opportunities to take immigrants' family ties or contributions to the country into account. They closed off routes through which immigrants could win forgiveness or second chances. And stipulations in both laws required that many immigrants await the outcomes of their civil cases behind bars, even when those people were not flight risks or threats to public safety. Propelled by AEDPA and IIRIRA, the size and lucrative nature of the country's immigration detention system expanded at an astounding rate. Over the next decades, immigration detention would emerge as one of the country's largest contributors to mass incarceration. IIRIRA also established expedited removal, a program of streamlined immigration hearings deployed in the border region. Expedited removal allowed relatively low-level immigration officers to act as judge, jury, and executioner in certain deportation cases. Under it, officers, not judges, could decide complex immigration cases in lightning quick proceedings with no possibility of appeal. As if that weren't tough enough, officers routinely prevented immigrants and expedited removal from accessing attorneys. And still, people crossed. Across the border, the influx of hopeful migrants caused Agua Prieta's population to increase by two-thirds in just five years. During the years of Douglas's industrial growth, the Mexican ranch and railroad town 
had remained small and tranquil. Prior to the late 1990s, contemporary Aguapeda had roughly two claims to fame in Mexico. The border city's fanatical devotion to baseball and Los Absin, one of the country's most popular 1960s rock bands. The arrival of foreign assembly factories in the 1980s drew job seekers like Rosie Mendoza to the city. But even then, Agua Prieta didn't expand as quickly or massively as other Mexican border cities. Prevention through deterrence turned all that on its head. Hundreds of overcrowded guest houses opened in the Mexican city. Business owners converted their stores, warehouses, service stations, and houses into makeshift shelters. They packed people into cramped rooms and charged $25 to $40 a night for the privilege. Less fortunate migrants slept on the streets or locked in smugglers' stash houses. The city's taxi drivers grew suddenly rich, shuttling a ceaseless line of migrants to staging areas in the desert. Later studies would show that the deterrent effects of punitive enforcement played a modest role, if any, in shaping people's decisions to attempt the border crossing. Many migrants had taken out debts of $3,000 to $10,000 at 10% monthly interest or more to pay smugglers. With loans coming due regardless of the migrant success in crossing, people had to keep trying. Reaching a well-paying job in the United States was the only way to make the payments on loans often secured by family farms. More broadly, socio-political forces shaped long-term migration patterns independent of border enforcement strategy. Shifting demand for labor in the United States, economic prospects in Mexico, and violent instability caused by the war on drugs influenced migration trends more than anything the Border Patrol did. Even experiences of cruelty and abuse had a negligible effect on migrants' decision to keep trying. This was particularly true for people fleeing violence or trying to reunite with family members in the United States. Processing upward of a thousand migrants in the night became routine in Douglas. Arrests far exceeded the capacity of the sector's border patrol station. Douglas simply didn't have the infrastructure to deal with the influx. The police chief, Charlie Austin, and his officers could not respond to all the calls about migrants. Groups of young men cut across yards and hid under porches and bushes. Families drank from garden hoses and, when surprised by border patrol, left piles of possessions strewn on the ground behind them. Some homeowners left their garages unlocked, knowing that people needing shelter on days above 100 degrees and nights below 30 would break doors and windows if they had to. Stepping outside to retrieve the morning newspaper, those same homeowners might also find an unknown woman and child slumped in exhausted sleep on their patio furniture. At dusk, Luz would call Ida and Cynthia to come inside during these years. It was better for the girls to stay off the streets when the nightly cat and mouse game began. Ida and Cynthia would heed her call, complaining all the way. Then Luz would lock the cramped apartment's doors and windows. Ida noticed that her mother also started locking the car doors. Even with the doors locked, though, the family sometimes woke knowing that someone had crawled inside the car to rest during the active night. The sleepers always left before morning, but Ida would sense impressions they left in the sedan. A slight rearranging of the Kleenex and old soft drink cups, the sharp smell of fear. It was hard to say exactly when the situation in Douglas hit its boiling point, but the why was clear. The crisis had, at first, largely enveloped a small town populated by brown-skinned residents with little political clout. But by early 1999, the massive influx of agents and technology into Douglas had pushed most undocumented border crossers outside the city limits, straight onto land owned by charismatic, well-connected Anglo ranchers. Suddenly, political clout was no problem. Politicians and the media tripped over each other in a headlong rush to empathize with the all-American landowners. Wendy Glenn was one of those ranchers. She and her husband, Warner, had grazed cattle in the vast scrubby basins and rugged ranges east of Douglas since the 1960s. Electric lines hadn't reached their house until 1985, 
Now they felt as if they lived in the middle of a highway. Night after night, groups of migrants, sometimes a hundred or more at a time, trailed through their property. Harried by border patrol, migrants abandoned their possessions in piles, tapped irrigation systems for water, and sometimes robbed supplies. Drug smugglers were worse. They cut cattle fences, careened across the land in ATVs, and threatened residents at gunpoint. Wendy recognized that undocumented Mexicans had helped build the Glen Ranch. For decades before prevention through deterrence, a handful of migrants would pass through the ranch every month. The Glens, like most ranchers in southeast Arizona, would give them food and shelter in return for work. These visitors would chop wood, paint barns, fix fences, and then move on to the next stop in their cyclical journey. Sometimes the same people came year after year. One man, a sharp dresser in a land where clean pressed jeans and a Carhartt vest passed as formal wear, spent part of every year working at a restaurant in Chicago and part of the year at home in Mexico. In between, he'd spend a few nights each at a string of ranches leading from the border to Stafford, Arizona. There he caught a Greyhound bus east. Despite the slicked hair and city threads, he understood ranch work and the Glens welcomed his sojourns at their place. After the buildup of border enforcement, though, that familiar cyclical migration came to a crashing halt. It was too risky to return to Mexico for visits and too expensive to cross the border every year. People like the stylish cowboy settled permanently in the United States. This proved one of the more ironic effects of stepped up border enforcement. Border militarization encouraged undocumented folks to remain in the United States for longer periods. Now, instead of familiar faces, the Glens saw only strangers. Wendy bristled at the abandoned belongings, water bottles, diapers, and food wrappers she encountered every day. And she worried about the ominous signs she'd discover. Once she found a whole family's shoes lined up under a tree. The owners vanished without a trace. Another time, it was precious family photographs arranged on a rock under a tree in the middle of nowhere. Ranchers found bodies, too. The bloated, fly-specked, newly dead, and the desiccated mummies, leathery after long seasons under the sun. The new migrants passing through Wendy's land were stressed, terrified, and unaccustomed to ranches. They trampled pastures, left gates open, and dropped animal strangling grocery sacks. Mostly, they kept their distance from locals. Only the most desperate approached the Glen's house. Once a woman appeared at their door. She had given birth prematurely out in the desert and cut the umbilical cord with a piece of broken glass. She asked if Wendy could help her reunite with her husband in Phoenix. At first, Wendy would sometimes offer a ride to friendly people she met in the backcountry. Eventually, she stopped that practice. Drug smugglers had pioneered routes east of Douglas and came in increasing menacing numbers. Fat wheeled quads stacked with bales of marijuana thundered through the night, slicing fences and destroying expensive irrigation equipment. Border patrol trucks pounded after them, doing just as much damage. Every rancher east of Douglas had stories of near escapes from armed men. When Wendy spoke out about these horrors, her voice carried authority. Her father had owned a mine that supplied the Douglas smelter with lime. Later, he became a state congressman. Her grandfather helped found Douglas. Wendy herself had helped found the Malpai Borderlands Group, a national model for rangeland conservation. In that work, she learned to speak across borders. She could talk to skeptical environmentalists about the importance of ranching and skeptical ranchers about what environmentalism offered their work. When it came to immigration, Wendy had politicians' ears and argued for moderation. The government had to do something to stop people crossing through rangeland, but the answer wasn't open war on immigrants. A big wall isn't the answer, she would tell Arizona's governor in 2005. The only way to end undocumented immigration and protect ranchers, she argued, was to address the root causes of poverty in Mexico. Many of Wendy's neighbors were not as even-handed, some took a more violent tack in the face of mounting frustration. Larry Vance, 
a rancher living a mile north of the border, declared that he was done with sleepless nights spent fearing home invasion. He erected a tower on his property and began keeping armed watch. Roger Barnett, one of Douglas's most vociferous critics of undocumented immigration, declared that he would begin hunting migrants on his 22,000 acre ranch. Humans, that's the greatest prey there is on earth, he menaced. And from 1999 to 2006, he followed through on his threat. During this time, the rancher seized and detained thousands of men, women, and children at gunpoint for border patrol on his ranch and nearby public lands. Most were undocumented. Some were local Latinos enjoying the outdoors in the wrong place at the wrong time. Mayor Ray Borain walked a tightrope between sympathy for migrants and sheer frustration. He wrote curt letters to President Clinton and published a blunt opinion piece in the New York Times. Instead of blaming people crossing through Douglas, he demanded that Americans take responsibility for the mess. Like Wendy Glenn, he urged a deeper reckoning with the causes of undocumented immigration. Why should one small town have to bear the consequences of politicians' failure to reform immigration policy? The federal government responded to this outcry, but not by addressing root causes. Instead, it deepened its enforcement-only approach. Border Patrol rushed reinforcements and resources to Douglas. By 2000, the local station, built to house 40 agents, overflowed with almost 600. That same year, the agency broke ground on what would be heralded as the biggest Border Patrol station in the nation. Stadium lighting, seismic sensors, night vision scopes, helicopters, and 20-foot-tall mobile sky towers looking like two-legged imperial walkers from Star Wars, followed. Multiple generations of border barrier, each one more imposing than the last, went up and down. An astonishingly ineffective billion-dollar high-tech virtual fence designed by Boeing came and went. For the young reporter Javier Zaragoza, it was an exciting time to be a journalist. National and international media descended on Douglas. News outlets declared it ground zero for people smuggling, the nation's new immigration battleground. Prize-winning reporters from New York and D.C. clamored for Javier's assistance. He took over the Douglas Dispatch's immigration beat and barely slept for eight years. For months at a stretch, when national and international interest was particularly acute, Javier spent his days escorting teams from news outlets like CNN, National Geographic, USA Today, and the Chicago Tribune. Reporters from Canadian and European newspapers came as well. He took them to see guest houses and streets filled with stores selling water bottles, backpacks, and cheap boots in Aguapieta. He'd point out the Douglas used car lots, tire stores, and gas stations getting rich off smugglers' transportation needs. He'd show camera teams where to set up for a shot of people climbing the fence. At night, he rode along with Border Patrol, taking notes and filming scenes of moonlit chases through desert scrub. In the morning, he filed his stories and started all over again. What was thrilling for the young reporter was frightening for Rosie Mendoza. She was struggling to raise five children alone amid the growing chaos. As Douglas filled with federal agents in the late 1990s and early 2000s, she taught her youngest son to carry his birth certificate. Border Patrol rarely hassled his lighter-skinned siblings, but the distinctive green and white trucks often tailed Rosie's darker-skinned son down the street. Later, when he learned to drive, he couldn't cross the border or pass a highway checkpoint without getting held for secondary inspection and additional screening. He started calling himself secondary. It was a joke, but it didn't feel funny. By 2001, the enforcement buildup managed to divert undocumented crossers from the center of town. More migrants and smugglers poured onto ranch land, but Douglas residents could sleep at night. The number of migrant apprehensions in town fell by 40%, and large groups of migrants no longer streamed through alleys and yards with as much abandon. Even Douglasites sympathetic to migrants appreciated the respite. It didn't take long, though for people to realize that they had simply exchanged one kind of invasion for another. Douglas has become a garrison for a federal force fighting an immigration war. 
Mayor Ray Borain wrote in a letter to President Clinton. Stadium lights on the border eliminated night, and helicopters beat through the air at all hours. The phrase border security slipped off politicians' tongues, smooth and easy. Who could argue against securing the border? Senators, governors, and cabinet secretaries flew over Douglas in Blackhawks, posed for photographs in front of the latest wall, and shook hands with ranchers in town hall meetings. Important men and women from Washington, D.C. and Phoenix drew lines in the sand and demanded the border be sealed. The border was broken and the country faced an existential threat. Double the border patrol became a frequent refrain. Every politician wanted more border security, but few agreed on what that meant. The one thing they agreed on was the need for more money. As Christopher Levy, an assistant chief of the border patrol, later complained, the lack of a clear definition of border security begot blundering and wasteful spending. Charlie Austin tried to downplay the need for intensified policing. Douglas hadn't reported a homicide in a couple of years, he would tell readers of the Los Angeles Times in 2005. As in other border towns, Douglas's crime rate was relatively low, but privately, he had to admit that the resources flowing to Douglas law enforcement lifted his spirits. Influxes of federal border security grants allowed him to carry out operations and investigations on a scale he thought few small-town police chiefs could imagine. He was glad to have federal reinforcements and a seemingly bottomless source of funding. Yet even the conservative police chief reached his limit sometimes. The taciturn Old West cop couldn't stand Border Patrol's daredevil driving. When he saw Border Patrol vehicles tearing through school speed zones at 60 miles an hour with no emergency in sight, he complained loudly. Border Patrol superiors smiled and nodded, but the situation didn't change. In the end, Chief Austin had to provoke a jurisdictional clash to see results. After he ordered his officers to ticket speeding Border Patrol vehicles, things got a little better. Mexican-American residents like Rosie Mendoza and her son grew accustomed to agents following them around town. Encounters with omnipresent Border Patrol fouled even quiet moments of pleasure and reflection. For as long as she'd lived in Douglas, Rosie had loved to hike and picnic in the beautiful country outside town. As border enforcement hardened, though, Rosie's family gave up its outdoor activities. Hiking through the backcountry was no fun when it meant long stops for questioning. Anglo ranchers, once the Border Patrol's most ardent supporters, learned to suffer roads torn apart by the green and white trucks. Agents in hot pursuit crushed irrigation pipes and left gates wide open. With the arrival of drones, seismic sensors, and remote cameras, ruggedly independent ranchers couldn't shake a sense that they were always being watched by someone, even when working alone in the empty desert. One cattleman recounted a call he'd received from a neighbor who flew Border Patrol drones at 17,000 feet. The agent was just being neighborly. He'd called to let the rancher know that he'd left his front gate ajar when he left home that morning. For many residents, the new Border Patrol recruits and federal agents rushed to Douglas on temporary assignment were the worst. Flushed with zeal, these agents were unfamiliar with the ways of the border and truly believed they were at war. They spent hundreds of thousands of dollars in Douglas's hotels and restaurants, but that was often the extent of their connection to the place. A Mexican-American law student whose family had lived in Douglas for generations lost his cool after one too many incidents of driving while brown. When the blonde-haired recruit pulled him over to ask, where are you from? The young attorney shot back, where are you from, Iowa? During this frenzied period, Douglas resembled an experiment in the psychology of fear. Residents experiencing similar conditions reacted in wildly different ways. Competing definitions of border security split neighbor from neighbor. Some saw migration as a scourge, a biblical plague, Others read the same signs as a Christian invocation to care for the stranger. Some lived in fear for their physical safety. Theirs were the loudest and angriest voices. Other residents found